and welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I'm Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and I'm very excited for today's show. We are checking in with the American Council of Engineering Companies of Colorado, better known as ACEC Colorado, and today we're talking about how drones are being used in surveying and civil engineering. And so uh, some of my audience knows, you guys, I told you a little bit earlier, I'm a total aviation nerd. I, uh, I have a background in aviation. So drones are an exciting new endeavor, new-ish, I would say. There's There's been a lot on the market for a long time, um, but we're finally seeing it used in uh, civil engineering, surveying, um, even you know private usage, which is really exciting. So I'm going to take a moment here to talk about who I have in the studio with me. I have Dave DeFolvio, who is joining me again. Welcome back to the show, Thank Dave. Thank you. Yes, so you're principal, licensed land surveyor with Farnsworth Group. How have you been? Doing great. Awesome. Doing great. Yeah, are you so excited to talk drones with me? You know, it, it's really cool. I'm yeah. kind of an aviation buff, too, so it's, yeah. it's neat. It is super neat. I'm very excited about that. I also have Shane Livingston here with me. He is a UAV pilot designer for Farnsworth Group. Mm -hmm. How are you doing, Shane? I'm doing great. How are you? Awesome. So uh, how did you get involved with this? And, and did you look at this through the lens of engineering or through the lens of being a pilot? Well, my background is in geography. That's what my degree is in. So um, mapping and, and being outdoors and things like that got me into uh, – sort of the uh, technology side of things. And then um, just uh, kind of seeing where things were going to progress as uh, everything advanced. So, uh, and I'm kind of into aviation as well. Um, but uh, just a kind of an easier way to do things as well. I look for an easier route to do things. So uh, the drones just seem to make sense for that kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Work smarter, not harder, right? Right. Yes. And I also have... Uh, Dennis Wolf here with me. He is a survey draftsman and UAV pilot for Olson. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about your background and how you ended up at Olson. I, I mean, I grew up with a huge passion for aviation. I think I feel like we all did. <laughs> I was always, you know, building and flying model airplanes as a kid. My grandpa always did that. Um, I think getting into survey, I, I went to school for AutoCAD, got my CAD degree, and it kind of just put me there. So I learned learned the survey world over the last couple of years. Um, came to Denver about a year ago to work for Olson. Uh, they brought me here and have been really awesome so far. Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, well, thank you. Um, and I am excited, as you all said. I, I I tend to forget coming from the commercial aviation world how much engineering and aviation actually really go together very well. Um, but I, I want to talk here, let's do a large overview, uh, general uh, drone usage in commercial setting uh, as used by professional engineers and professional surveyors. Um, if you don't mind distinguishing the use of drones in commercial setting versus those in general public usage or private setting. So myself with my drone in my backyard, right? The one that I built. <laughs> Terrible. Don't I, I wouldn't want to show it off. But <laughs> I'll start here with you, Dave. Well, yeah, these guys are the two pilots that are <laughs> a lot more into the details on there. I know enough to be dangerous, but um, uh, I, I use it from a business standpoint. But, you know, to, at least from my perspective, the difference is that, you know, the, the commercial use of uh, dr the drone is nothing more than a vehicle to take some instruments that are usually cameras or sensors, right? And they're a different type of vehicle that's been used in the past. Um, they're a lot more expensive and can do a lot more things and have a lot more capability than the type you buy at Best Buy or, or something like that, the consumer version. Um, and just the size alone is something you you really just don't do. So it's just capability. Yeah. You know, so the, other than that, the, the equipment is also a, a hugely expensive piece of, of our equipment. I know Shane will talk about, you know, he's, he's our pilot, but we just took delivery on a, a couple of them. And you know, what entry level cameras start out with thirty, forty, fifty thousand, and well, go up from there. Well, they can be cheaper, but we we kind of went into a realm of higher end camera for uh, uh, the high density of the data we're collecting. So, um, uh, I mean, I started out using four or five thousand dollar cameras, uh, or cameras on four or five thousand dollar systems. Um, but uh, we use what's called a medium format camera, and that's kind of getting into the professional photogrammetry world um, of just kind of taking aerial imagery, um, just more pixelated, you know, higher def uh, images so that uh, you can use it in conjunction with uh, three-dimensional data to really pick out areas that 
for design and things like that. Cool. So I, do you run into this? I, I think as a consumer, if I'm going to go to Best Buy and buy one of these, right, I'm going to look at prices. And some people have the mentality that more expensive is always better, right? And I think from usage and reviews on things that sometimes it's not always the case. Do you run into that as far as commercial use is concerned as well? Well, you, you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all about what you budget for and what you're trying to do. Um, I mean, you can spend all the money in the world, but if you're only doing a certain thing, it, you know, you have all these capabilities that you won't get into. So you have to look at what you want to use it for and kind of see what's out there and make choices on that. So um, the sensors uh, that we use, the camera, the LiDAR, are really 80% of what the cost is. And then you have the software that goes along with that. So uh, um, I think it's just an approach of what you're going to use it for is what you spend. You know. Gotcha. Is that the same with Olsen as well? I would say it's pretty consistent across the board. Okay. I mean, you can spend all the money in, you, in the world, as just as you said, but, I mean, you got to look at uh, what kind of product you're looking for at the end of that. After all of that processing, if you don't have a good camera up front, you know, you don't, you don't have that resolution. You're not going to have the precision precision on the other end of it. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the equipment that's used, right? And so you've mentioned cameras, and mm -hmm. there's also software. Let's talk a little bit about the software itself, because it's not just downloading the pictures, right? Let's let's talk about what that does. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and for the most part, I would suggest that talk about usually the – maybe that's the big difference between the professional commercial uses of drones and – the type you see for uh, for residential uses, you know, the most of the the residential stuff and even other photographers or whatever are just looking at images. Mm -hmm. the, you know, you they they're well, taking one image. <laughs> yeah, either camera, still images, or or video, right? It's like a GoPro, right? Mm -hmm. Up up yeah. in aerial stuff. We're using it to collect data that's going to go in to use it for design of something, typically or mapping of something. I mean, you guys can get into more explaining that. Well, yeah. you, you say, you know, they'll use one image, say, for real estate or something like that. And what we do, we will take 500 images or 1,000 images and create one image from it. Okay. You know, we'll call that an ortho photo. And it's, you know, kind of similar to what you see on Google Earth. Yeah, the image comes, it, is, is a huge piece of imagery. So it's, you're taking the resolution of the smaller photos, you spread them across a much bigger area. But it's, it's also scaling it, so from every angle you look at it, you're looking straight down at it. So oh. everyth everything is square, everything is flat. Okay. So that's something kind of cool that a lot of people don't people yeah. don't know about. I definitely didn't know that. Uh, exciting stuff. Yeah. So I how how long uh, and I'm sure this varies from project to project. Um, let's say we're looking at uh, building a school. Okay. Oh, just throwing that out there. Um, how long would that surveying take that initial one that you're going to take a drone picture of? Mhm. Mm do you have an idea about that? Uh, I mean, generally, I mean, most of these can only fly 20 minutes at a time. Right. Uh, which doesn't have a bearing on how large the area you're surveying. You just land, change batteries, and keep going. Um, it kind of goes into, like, what kind of camera you have. So the camera I have can take a wider uh, shot on the ground as opposed to, a, you know, a smaller camera. So I have to take – I can take fewer images. I can fly quicker. Um, so – Anywhere, you know, let's say a typical school, I, I mean, you could fly that or a subdivision in, you know, 20 or 30 minutes and be, be out of there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about safety because we, we have cameras in use, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that there's some privacy issues that we run into. Um, I know for a fact I've had several people on here talking about legislation uh, within <laughs> drones, right? Uh, and so I know that there's not a whole lot that you might be able to answer as far as safety is concerned. Um, and it changes constantly. We're definitely mm -hmm. seeing that right now. Yep. Um, but what, what can you say would be a good safety measures that you guys are using in place right now? I would just say, um, like, to me, planning is a big part of whenever you're doing one of these flights or any kind of data collection for surveying. And um, you just take into account your environment, uh, of course, who would be involved, you know, a, a project in the forest would be different than a project in a suburban neighborhood. So, right. so you want to take account those parameters and and plan your flight out accordingly. Um, um, we're doing a project on a highway now that we have road closures. So there's you know 
little we can do more than that to be safe because we're not keeping people off the road and stuff. So uh, I think notification and, and signage and, um, you know, efforts like that would make it easier to be safe. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, is there any frustrations that you guys have right now with kind of the, the uh, safety and the, the legislation that's all over the place? <laughs> Well, <laughs> you guys look at each other. <laughs> it, sure. the, there's some clarity in some of the <coughs> legislation, and then to me, there's some ambiguity. Um, um, you know, I, I filled out a big six, seven page paper one time to try to get a waiver, and they pretty much told me I didn't need it. <laughs> so, oh, no. Um, <laughs> and so it's not always clear when and, when and where you need those waivers. Yeah. yeah. I think that, and I think that clarity will come. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, that's the frustration is. As this new technology comes online, things change. So you get used to one thing and it changes. So yep. that's kind of a frustration, you know. Yeah, a little bit. absolutely. Well, hopefully our legislators can get on board with oh, fixing yeah. that. <laughs> um, so walk me through this process of uh, how drones are being used in surveying exactly. So um, from planning and preparation to permitting, walk me through that process. So a lot of it starts again with uh, what do you want to get out of it? Some of it is 3D modeling. Some of it is more topography. You're looking for contours and elevations and maybe f drainage or, you know, the possibilities are kind of endless in that, like that. But um, go ahead. Let's go with 3D modeling. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's say we need some 3D modeling. So what? I'll yeah. take you back to something I was doing uh, based out of Florida. I was traveling from paper, paper mill to paper mill just all across the southeast. We were doing their uh, wood chip pile inventories, which are you know, these huge, massive piles of wood chips, you know, millions of cubic feet, very big. Um, so they're looking for a 3D model where we calculate the volume. So we go out there and set up our control. We do our flight in 30 minutes or so, and then we're out of their way. And that's, that's one of the areas where drones have really, really helped us there. Um, in the past, I've been on those same sites and had to survey them conventionally, and I would be on one of those piles for hours and hours. And meanwhile, you're, you got earplugs in your ears. There's bulldozers driving around that can't see in front of them because the plow is so big. You're, you're dodging bulldozers. <laughs> you're fighting the heat. <laughs> it's like, it's not even, you can't compare the two. The, using, using the UAVs in that situation and not even stepping foot on that pile, not only is it safer, it's faster, and it's way more precise as far as the, the detail you get out of the product. As soon as we started showing that to these guys, they, they didn't ever want us on the pile again. They're like, why would you not do this? Yeah. So huge what? benefit. Huge benefit. And that's, that's the biggest safety aspect of this, yeah. too, is, is a lot of the usage that we're talking about here is replacing a, a live person in those on the ground in those conditions, mm -hmm. whether it be in a road, whether it be on some piles in a wetland area, mm -hmm. uh, up, up in the Rocky Mountains on some very, very steep slopes and so yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, and I, I do still occasionally see surveyors right around and stuff. Uh, is as far as we're going with this, do you do you happen to note that maybe some uh, firms are are delaying uh, in use of drones for safety reasons, or would you say it's more of a money problem? And not that you want to speak for other firms, this is just an opinion. <laughs> I would say I would lean towards that initial investment. You're okay. looking at a pretty big chunk of change that. You gotta you gotta have a plan in place to make that money back, right? And a lot of companies right now they don't necessarily want to make that initial investment. Yeah, but I imagine you're already getting your money back from investing. Well, if you com if you compare it to you know other tools in the survey world, you look at a total station, which is you know your typical. You see the guy standing on the road looking through it. Yeah. A lot of people might think it's a camera, um, <laughs> <laughs> or your your GPS units that have the precision of a you know, of survey grade, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars for a lot of that stuff. Yeah. For your laser scanners or you can get started with the UAV package for much less than that. It's a fraction of it. And you can do very similar things. Interesting. Did not know that. I mm -hmm. appreciate that information. Um, so I, tell me a little bit about uh, how we're using the data that is collected by drones. Obviously, if we're looking at 3D modeling, you get those pictures and putting them in place. Uh, so tell me about how else that data might be used. Uh, well, I'll use a project we're about to work on as well. Uh, so we're working on a highway project that we're doing a widening on the road. So um, it's along a river, 
Um, again, this would save on like using a live person to get down there on the edge of water and going on in and out of the roadway. Uh, so we'll use this three-dimensional data to give to the engineers and they will um, use the imagery and the, the point cloud scan to, to extract points that they need to design the road. So um, it's a, uh, you know, probably doing it uh, at least half the time it would take traditionally, uh, a little bit more on the, on the processing side. But if you miss something, you also have that data that you can mine. Uh, so typically, you know, you go out and do a survey inevitably there's something you're going to miss and you have to mobilize back out so this kind of saves you from doing that and it makes it quicker yeah awesome. that, that's up in the mountains too yeah yeah so you know cause that's the other beauty of what we're doing with drones is we're covering pretty good stretches of ground you know that it's not just a like a school site it's not just a chunk of ground on the roadway and pipeline corridors it's a long stretch that you're mapping and getting some very good data and you know, on a road, that's another thing is there's a lot of people that on the consumer end that don't pay attention to the, the rules and the laws. What? I mean, we're limited to 400 <laughs> feet in height, right? Yeah. And um, you can't be over people or traffic. You know, so mm -hmm. any any roadways <coughs> drone work that you see a company do, you better close that road. Right. Otherwise, they're not quite legal. Right. Uh, okay. But that's a, it's a lot easier to do something like that with better data under well, those conditions. And you'd have to have a road closure for, you know, some of the surveying we would do on that road. Sure. Um, and there's an aspect before you even fly these things, you're doing still surveying. You're having to put out ground control points and targets. So uh, it's not removing that component. It's just lessening the amount of time that someone is on the ground doing something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, let me ask you this. I'm, I'm only be, I, for pure curiosity on my point. Could I do this from home? Can I man this from home? Uh, you mean I, pilot, pilot it from yeah. home? Uh, at your house, you yeah. can. Uh, yeah. Uh, as far as working for Farnsworth, if, I, if you hired me as a UAV pilot, uh -huh. can I just do my job from home? Uh, no, you'd have to be on site at a project. You know, you have to have visual contact with the aircraft. Um, and you got to know what the aircraft is doing. You have to get used to, you know, different things that you have to do if things go wrong. Mm -hmm. I've had um, aircraft that would veer off course because it lost connection or something. So you have to know how to 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 man the the remote, bring it back to a safe place. So um, no, it's a it's an on-site type of thing. Uh, now there's a lot of planning you could do from home. So okay. Yeah. And the post processing, you could, you could process it all from home. Yeah. Tell you know, me about you know if you have the computer that can handle it. <laughs> of course, right. yes. Um, tell me about post processing. What's what is that like? Um, well, w we have a drone that carries lidar, so it's light range, light distance and ranging. Um, so it's basically sending pulses of light. So we're getting millions and millions of points uh, along with imagery. Um, so the front end processing on that is you know you bring that data in and you have to bring it into a coordinate system that your project's set at. Um, and then output it in a usable product. And then once you get that done, you have a what's called a point cloud. And then you compared with our uh, used with the imagery, that's when you start extrapolating data, you know, like trees or edge of road, things like that. So it depends on the size of the data mm -hmm. and the computers you have. Like you said, um, it can take anywhere from a couple hours process to a day, you know, just as a computer crunching the data. So gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, so were you both surveyors before you became pilots? I was a pilot before a surveyor. I actually, oh, okay. um, I didn't mention this. I'm a, I'm a, I have my private pilot's license as well. Um, again, I said that was a passion of mine growing up. Um, I actually solo f soloed in an airplane before I had my driver's license. <laughs> I was 15 years old. It's pretty typical if somebody um, gets the aviation bug. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was fun. Nice. Nice. Um, when I asked that, because I, I kind of want you to paint a picture of comparing surveying to now doing the UAV piloting. Um, I mean, to me, I'm I'm in the process of trying to work towards my pilot lesson, but I became a uh, a Part 107 pilot before I uh, before I actually survey. And my background's in geography, so those things kind of work together. And I got into surveying and realized uh, it's more use in this than anything. Um, I think the mindset's still the same, the attention to detail, the kind of awareness, uh, the spatial awareness that you have to have. Um, 
so I think those things go hand in hand, that type of work, you know. You know, and for what we're doing, you know, the, the drone mapping, if you will, because we have the, both the LiDAR and the imagery stuff, uh, are, are just another tool of many that we use to obtain that same type of data. Right. And, and I think that's the difference between surveying is we're, we're just collecting data and I'll put it in different formats for different people. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the drone is... You know, we used to use aircraft for that, fixed aircraft. Mm -hmm. We're on the ground picking that data up and all sorts of stuff. So it's yeah. another nice tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. And I've heard, you know, some people will say, oh, drones are going to put surveyors out of business. I don't think that's the no case way. at all. I think it's no just way. a great tool for us to use. And yep. what it does is it brings the site yeah. to the office. We end up surveying it at our desk. Yeah. It fills it's in really the voids, what yeah. you know, that you would normally have. It's a, it's a historical imagery, imaging of your site as it was on the day you surveyed it, I think it's it's only going to get better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of people are under this impression that as we move forward with technology, no matter what industry, so for example, uh, the uh, check yourself out cash, cash lanes, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, cashiers are going to be put out of business. Well, that's simply not true. You're just going to have to change what your job is exactly, yeah. right? And so you yeah. have seven cash cashier cash registers that you're in charge of now instead of just one right right yeah and so i imagine this is pretty much the same concept there mm -hmm. um so any uh, i'm going to ask you here specifically dave um tell me a little bit about the, i imagine that you were in the process of moving into uh the uav world versus being on the ground surveying um talk me through well you do both and you have you to have both. both yes i i Sorry, I do keep no, no, thinking you're, you're about that. <laughs> um, I know that you still do both, but um, having this nice new technology, mm -hmm. um, talk to me about the process about how you wanted to make sure that was that Farnsworth Group got a hold of that. You know, we're pretty frugal, and we typically will stay a step back from being out in the front leading edge. We don't want to be out in the front leading edge. That's it's a bleeding position. place to be and, <laughs> and very expensive. Um, so we kind of let, let whatever technology evolve enough to – it, it makes sense from a business standpoint. Yeah, we could use it. It's going to save us time and money. We're going to make money at it. Um, it. It allows us a lot greater flexibility on projects. We can get in and do some things that we didn't before. So there's a lot of advantages. Um, and and it, obviously, it's where it's going. And as the technology, probably the biggest limitation right now, I'd say, is the battery life. Um, yeah, but that's changing. And that's changing rapidly. Exactly. So invest in batteries is what you're saying. Oh, it's not a bad place <laughs> to be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, any last thoughts here as far as um, I always like to ask people to uh, tell me why people should join being an engineer or perhaps being a UAV pilot. What kind of advice would you give for somebody that's looking into those worlds? Maybe we've got a geography major out there who's who's looking for different career paths. Um, I would just say just that it's never the same thing you're always doing something different you're always having to think about an approach different way yeah so i would say um just the difference in in what you're doing day on a day-to-day -day basis it makes it interesting so awesome advice oh i would i would definitely agree i like the travel i like every project's new everything's kind of a new challenge yeah. um you get to you basically i mean I see it as I provide a canvas for the engineers to draw on, <laughs> you know, that's my job. I like that. That's a great outlook to yeah. have. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Awesome. No matter where your data comes from. Yeah. It's, it's always just more fun with a drone. <laughs> it's very true. Love hearing that. Thank you very much, Thank gentlemen. You. It has been a pleasure having you on. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube page while you're here. You can find this podcast and more at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Bye. Hello, and welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, uh, and I am continuing today's topic with uh, Tyler Kibish and Mark Hamos. Uh, these guys are talking about drones in civil engineering this time. We were talking drones in surveying, uh, and the show is brought to you by American Council of Engineering Companies of Colorado. Uh, so... Exciting stuff. Tyler, welcome. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you for having us. Yes, absolutely. And Mark, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Oh, good, fine. Thank you. Keeping busy. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so great to hear. Um, so, uh, Tyler, you are a project manager, geospatial services within the aerial mapping uh, group at Ares Associates. 
Oh uh, yeah, it's actually uh, Ayers Associates. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm out, actually out of the uh, Madison, Wisconsin uh, office, in Sun Prairie, but uh, we actually have an office in uh, Fort Collins as well here. Okay, so uh, are you originally from Wisconsin? Yes, I am. All right, so what do you think about Colorado? How's it been for you? Oh, I just love it out here. Yeah, awesome. I, I know that we're not nearly as nice as most of the mi people in the Midwest, <laughs> but I hope you're having a good time. Oh, there's plenty of transplants here in, in uh, Colorado, <laughs> so there's plenty of friendly faces. Yes, for sure. And Mark, you are a PE Senior Project Manager at Harris Co Coker. Coker's, thank you, and Smith Engineering. Correct. Yes, so uh, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got into it. Well, I've been with Harris Coker Smith since the first of the year. It's a site development survey utilities company. Briefly to that, I uh, worked at a structural engineering firm, had my own firm for years. Actually got the firm into drones in that using structural evaluation. And actually had a, have an operator's license for a drone for a while, but uh, never did get my FAA um, pilot's license for drone fl flight yet, so. Okay. Um, well, there's always time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Just another test. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like how you, spoken like a true engineer right mm -hmm. there. <laughs> Just another test. Yeah, bring it on, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about how drones are being used in civil engineering. So we know from the surveying side, it makes a lot of sense to have drones when you're out mapping, right? Um, so in the civil engineering space, give me an overview of why drone technology is important in your industry. I'm gonna start here with you, Tyler, and then I'll jump in anytime. Sure, well, uh, it, it's, it's very important to actually collect uh, high resolution accurate imagery and tie that down uh, to the location uh, mapped on the ground so we can actually map planimetric features uh, for for engineering purposes so you can start to uh, get on-site uh, builds um, as as is builds and uh, and try to uh, plan out new construction phases as you go and you can also uh, do quite a bit of site monitoring as a construction progress uh, happens throughout your project that's uh, very important uh, documentation uh, projects for for most pro uh, projects across the board. Yeah, thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, it's good. Like you say, Tyler said, documentation is a big thing. If you just look out your window here with the big I-70 project, there was a lot of documentation beforehand. And then as the project goes, um, they will kind of document it uh, just to kind of watch the different phases. And also, once you kind of build something over something, then you can't see what it used to look like. At least you got a picture of it before. But uh, my background is more in structural use of drones, um, environmental use of drones, um, more for assessment, places that are tough to access. But there's a lot of challenges with that too because you're outside, you're in the wind, the sun sometimes can, can block your, your cameras, um, but uh, there's a lot of benefits to the safe use of drones too. Say like, especially after natural disasters, um, like floods here, like six yeah. years ago, um, fires and that, you can send a drone into an area and assess it before you send people in. And that's a big benefit. Um, and uh, you know, for, for a you know, project like that, for, for people's safety before you go in, especially earthquakes, California, um, you can send that into out over on bridges to look at, see what a bridge looks like before you send the people out in that. So a lot of, a lot of uses that we're just, I think, really starting to really realize too. The, the future is looking pretty open, a lot more ideas where we can use the drones still. So. Yeah, we definitely use the uh, the UAS and drone services to capture uh, as built during the construction progress, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, certain companies, maybe a natural gas plant is being built and they're laying out pipes. Uh, and they they want to capture that image from an aerial standpoint, and then we can tie that to the ground and create uh, uh, some CAD drawings of their their line work uh, before they maybe cover that up with uh, with concrete or dirt or however they're they're burying those those features underground they would like to capture that information before it's it's unseen it's underground so we can bring that into a software environment and use that uh, during the construction mm -hmm. and, and planning and phases and, and as engineers we're very visual people so taking a shot just like the street out here if we were going to rebuild the street you'd fly a drone over you'd see the the heavy cap ramps you see the curbs the gutters the stripes and all that and so you're working with a CAD technician um, and where they can actually have a photograph 
on the screen and you, then you're drawing vectors and other improvements that you want to lay on top of it so so it can actually help visually really assess and, and design uh, the new work that you want to do too so I exactly um, once you have the the imagery you can build on top of that with the planimetric features you know the curb and the gutter or or the the buildings the uh, the center lines like you're saying the road lines that really mm -hmm. helps getting those into a vector environment for your CAD specialists to start uh, really uh, pinning down to a centimeter level uh, to get your you know, your plan for for your city or your uh, streets or, or what have you yeah. Yeah. We we also use it for um, current and from or, uh, current company is uh, quality control is actually drone. We can go ahead and get the work done, take a look at it, and like was mentioned before, the drone is not going to be a substitution for surveying. There's a whole legal part that's transfer of real estate, that is really the heart of what surveyors really do. So they have to make sure that their their descriptions and and every and the maps they use are very accurate. Well, we use it to uh, make the do the legal descriptions and then fly over it again and just check it and that's a quality control it's in itself and sometimes sometimes you find the description is not is not correct or maybe need to be tweaked a little bit too so and then uh, just you know at the end of a project or so to as a last check before you say put out a, a drawings for a bid um, kind of do quality control just kind of fly over one more time our our surveyors actually fly every project whether we get paid to or not in some respects where we do the ground surveying and then just fly it anyway it gives us a documentation it's like a record yeah who knows when we'll be back you know so uh, we do a lot of re engineering firms do a lot of repeat business We're, we got the 80 20 percent of clients you know old clients new clients and so we may be doing something again some engineers have been around long enough that uh, we're actually redesigning stuff we did 30, 40 years ago now. So, you know, it, uh, we've got that knowledge and uh, so it can kind of help uh, document. And plus, really, the, the new technology is really more fitting the younger generations. Um, they're really more tech savvy and, and that than we are. And so it's more of a way to really record and document and maybe save a lot of intellectual uh, capital that we really need for down the road, too. So. Yeah, I think it's really important to take that snapshot in time, like you're saying, if you, know, you have a, some imagery beforehand or maybe some imagery after the project completes, um, but who knows, you might be back in the future down the road a year later or so and get another opportunity to take that, that imagery again, and you can do a lot with change detection analysis over that time. Maybe you're uh, trying to analyze a landfill uh, site to, uh, for cut and fill. Uh, maybe there are uh, some other projects where your erosion is happening and you're wanting to see where the deposition is occurring farther downstream. Uh, you know, there, there's very uh, great opportunities for just having that snapshot in time and then uh, going back to that and doing some analysis. Analysis. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate all of that information, and I, I like hearing uh, you mentioned specifically that the newer generations are appreciating mm -hmm. this technology, and so it's another way to keep your industry alive and well with people that are interested in getting those careers. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how drones might be used in red in residential areas for engineering purposes. Um, so a little different, right? We, When we typically talk with engineers, we talk projects, right? Big buildings, stadiums, schools, things like that that are being built. But in the residential areas, is there much difference? Well, for uh, Ayers Associates, we have a lot of uh, utility work that uh, goes along, whether that be corridor projects uh, for pipelines or for overhead transmission corridors. And within that right of way, there's uh, oftentimes uh, vegetation encroachment uh, that might be an issue or clearance issues between the, the, the cables, the wires, and the ground, or maybe a building. Uh, so in residential areas, there may be you know, an issue of mitigation uh, uh, of tree limbs or cutting down removal of, of dead trees, um, but there's also going to be you know, clearance issues for the sag of the lines. So if you can get a LIDAR uh, survey from a UAS and you can do some measurements in CAD and get, the, uh, get some measurements of the sag of the lines and wonder if there's going to be any clearance issues for uh, trucks passing underneath, um, there's there's great benefits to those those types of surveys, especially in high use areas uh, for residential. And when you're when you're doing projects in that residential area, you, you always want to be you know greater concern is safety of the people. You want everybody to be involved, know what you're doing, and you know people are going to be boots on the grounds and the yellow vests and have a lot of line of sight in, in those projects. Yeah. Well, different kind of uh, uses are can actually be realized with drones, both say existing residential that's going to be renewed or say brand new rural areas that are just acres and, and farmland. 
and need to be assessed. Um, so if I can address the first the first one in the rural areas where it's just cropland, say. Yeah. Um, you take a drone out there, and, and this is where you can actually use uh, infrared-type cameras, too. Assess the different types of vegetation. This is really done in agriculture quite a bit, and, and my family's got a background in agriculture. Um, and uh, um, it's used, you can see just different colors pop up from the land. But that's also a way to assess the environmental mitigation you might have to do to develop drainages or get uh, get things kind of mitigated if you got like certain weeds or or that that are um, um, orchids or something like that, some kind of, of uh, flowers that need to be protected. So that can be done. And that's again, a use of infrared technology. Um, in the urban areas, a lot of it uh, uh, is just kind of documenting what we have, but it's a very urban jungle with more concrete, asphalt, bricks, mortars, and that. And then trying to just get a feel for what, again, environmentally could be there, what kind of structures, how old they are. Um, also, uh, access to certain structures, too, with, with uh, say, bridges in that. Uh, we can use the uh, infrared cameras to assess uh, the concrete surfaces of bridges to see whether they're delaminated. They may need to be repaired or replaced, or if they're safe to drive over and that, too, to access the construction for a, a new neighborhood or something like that. So um, it's, not all res it's not all just single family. You look at multifamily in that, too. Um, you know, the density is, is becoming more and more common, especially in the urban areas. And like uh, Tyler said, utilities are really becoming an issue. Um, whether you can believe the, the utility maps we get from utility companies, which you still got to be careful. You know, they did the best they could, but you still got to be careful. But at the same time, we, we have to locate the utilities first and then survey those in. If we can also fly them too, that gives us another record, especially when they tear it all up and then it's all gone and then there's still stuff underground. And uh, that gives us a record, a very detailed, very accurate record of where it could be. Mm -hmm. Trying to protect the contractor from hitting a gas line or electric line or something that's nasty like that, so. Uh, yeah, you know, and I think m more and more they're taking a, from a UAS standpoint, uh, using the, the drone to capture that, uh, those those as belts as they're being buried, so you can capture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where those those pipelines are, where the where the lines are um, for electrical, and before they bury that, so they can get that into their, um, their, their, their records yeah, and use that geospatially. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and you guys, you guys have touched on it quite a bit, but the safety aspects alone, I think, are, are phenomenal for what we can use these for, right? Even uh, the infrared cameras for deteriorating bridges. It's not even mm -hmm. something that I would have thought of, but obviously that's a big use of drones. Yeah, w uh, Ares Associates are, is doing a lot of uh, uh, chimney inspections as well. Uh, so where uh, you don't necessarily want to put a body or a you know, person up uh, scaling on the side of a large industrial chimney. You might uh, not want to. Right, or to inspect the inside of it. So we're able to uh, get a, uh, a drone up there on the side of the, the chimney, inspect it from uh, you know, a mere few feet away and for any cracks or structural issues. But then you can also look inside from the top uh, so that's rather precarious uh, spot for a person to be in. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's a, a great use to, to remove the person from that situation. Awesome. Well, I had a project about a year and a half ago. It was a, a fairly new bridge over the Platte River over here in Denver. And circumstances were it, was, it had to be done in early December. It was cold, like six degrees. And I think our drone battery life was like 11 minutes. So... We had multiple batteries, and to get the work done, we were shooting with a new camera that was really heavy, mm -hmm. too. But the but the precision, we could even tell the bolt heads on the connections, which is what we were looking to do, is document that. Yeah. But it was such that we actually used two operators, one to actually fly the drone, then one to take the pictures. So we were with the guy taking pictures and telling the drone operator just because it was just safer to do that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, we couldn't go out in the Platte River. There was ice. It was cold. It was just mm -hmm. impossible to go out there. So uh, so we were able to handle that, and, uh, and we were glad when we went inside after that. So <laughs> <laughs> after it was done. I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, you're used to that. That was probably 
really was yeah, it was cold, like summertime for negative you. Negative 40s, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah, summertime in Minnesota, yeah, December here. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So. Um, we've also done some work with some thermal cameras. Uh, for for example, some transmission lines, you might want to inspect uh, the, the, uh, the poles for weak spots or hot spots is what they're called. And so if you can put a uh, different sensor on your, your drone, like a thermal camera, you could uh, do a site inspection of that pole and, and really pinpoint where the, the issue spots are. So again, you're removing that person from the issue. They don't have to touch everything or, or test everything you know, hands on. You're getting a, a better picture from a safe distance away. Yeah. We've come a long way with this technology. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we are getting people out of harm's way. We're able to complete projects faster, right? Just inevitably, this technology has been amazing. Where do we see this being used in the future? What are some future applications that you guys see uh, drones being applicable to? Well, I see, yeah. um, I see the sensors becoming smaller, uh, more lighter weight. And uh, more more applicable for a wider range of uses. For example, we've been talking about four band imagery, infrared imagery, and, and mainly just oblique imagery or, or, or straight down or ortho ortho photos. Oh, um, we've touched on lidar a little bit for 3D modeling, and that's kind of at the forefront. Those sensors have become smaller and available. But uh, hyperspectral uh, imagery is also uh, a, a new avenue where there's hundreds of bands within the sensor and so you can get down to uh, the senescence and get uh, individual plants uh, you know like like you were saying you get individual sensitive wetland plants saying that these uh, these uh, sedges are uh, are a key indicator species then we need to preserve them so we can map those more accurately with this hyperspectral sensor um, I, from my standpoint I've seen those come down in size and down in price recently and I'm hoping they'll come become even cheaper well, and I'm hoping that the drones themselves actually become more robust. Battery life is just a killer right now. Even the best you can hope on a day is 20, 25 minutes. And that just seems you just get started with something. But, I mean, you always have, and really, I mean, for two grand, you can really get a decent system with about three, four batteries and chargers and a case and all that. That's really a pretty good commercial. But, however, um, we're very limited in which direction the cameras can go. Um, without buying different types of drones where we can maybe look, look, look up vertically. That's very difficult to do with most drones these days. Um, the uh, um, other um, thing that would be nice is just to kind of where you can actually kind of feather them a little easier against structures because a lot of times we need to get within two to three feet of a structure to really assess it. One of the one, um, and, and it's like say like a big high mass light, 140 feet in the air. The winds up there get pretty pretty rough, and they're they're actually pretty good where they kind of just stabilize themselves. But you really want to get kind of close. You look at connections, bolts, and things, and and the wind is making go this way. And and uh, I had two really young, probably in their mid 20s, but they were used to playing video games, and they were <laughs> excellent drone pilots too. You I know. would imagine. They, yeah. uh, I I stopped playing with Mario Nintendo my daughter was about five years old I wish I'd have kept going that would help these days but uh, but you know just the, the use of the drones itself and they'll become more reliable longer la I think really the battery technology you know because someone like Elon Musk can really get that punch through sure. will change everything to your phones to your computers and that and drones and that so but I think we just we're still looking for different ways to use drones in that um, um, so it'll be something we'll just keep keep evolving in that uh, I think you touched on it too another key aspect of the future is that the younger generations are more intuitive with this technology uh, you know you may uh, get one in the family household for Christmas or something and the kids fly it around and crash it and then it's in the dog's hair or something. But uh, your kids are becoming uh, aware of these devices and interacting with them. And so uh, there's many universities that have individual programs for UAS, UAV, uh, and, and becoming uh, uh, certified pilots uh, in, in that realm. So I think uh, the more, uh, more interest there is for the younger generations, the obviously it will take off. Oh. Well, technology is one thing, but I think really we need to kind of just step back to and say, okay, what's the perception that a lot of hobbyists use drones for? And then it also affects how we can actually do business. It may actually impact. You mentioned legislation and that most of it is at the federal level. The FAA is really the big, big gorilla kind of over everybody. And you got to get permits in that. Um, <laughs> we we had a project. We got permits. It took like forever. But then we also were near an air force base, and uh, 
So they said, we don't care where the FAA is. We'll just shoot your drone down if it comes on our property. So you, you know where you stand. At yeah, least, exactly. You know, that's, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just to really keep this perception and this distinction different between good commercial use where we really need it for doing good work and then a hobbyist and play. But sometimes the hobbyists are the ones that really – give the biggest perception against you know, what we're trying to really accomplish here. And so I think part of it's trying to also maybe uh, modify some behavior so that the younger people kind of appreciate it for what it is and not just something you just open up on Christmas Day and you zip up to 3,000 feet right in the airspace right away <laughs> and right. endanger everybody, you know, just because you can, you know, so. Yeah, very so. well said. I, I agree with you. I think we do need some behavior modification there. Um, I also want to reiterate to our audience, we keep using the terms UAV and UAS, and that stands for unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned aerial systems. So I just want to make sure everyone's mm -hmm. on this. I know you guys know, but some people may not. So. Yeah, they're all interchangeable. Yeah. And yeah. Drones. We just haven't figured an acronym so. for drone yet. Do you? Yeah. It, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. We'll work on that. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, come on, you guys. <laughs> I thought you had already come up with one by now. Um, well, I, I do want to ask you, um, and this is kind of I, I, not off topic, but is the use of drones ever dictated by project budget? Would there ever be a time that you would say, okay, let's cut the drones for this project? I, I don't, I don't foresee that. I imagine it's saving money in the long run, but yeah. yeah. So for in our case, in Aeros Associates case, we um, for small sites, uh, we have a pre-planning protocol where we we assess the site and uh, analyze if it's even viable for uh, a, a UAV to go there and. Uh, uh, are there a lot of trees? Are there a lot of buildings? Are there a lot of uh, 3D uh, objects that, that could hamper that, that site? Um, but generally, if it's a small site, um, it, it's such as uh, you're going to save costs on the acquisition, on the mobilization, you know, getting your crew there, getting your survey guy there, and, and getting the bird up in the air. That's where you're really going to save, save on costs. Um, as soon as you get to uh, a much larger area um, where they're, they're going over uh, possibly people, residential, or roads, then I think that's where you're going to be cutting out the UAS or UAV. You're going to be going to more of a fixed-wing traditional um, aircraft uh, environment, I think, in that realm, mm -hmm. would you say? That's true. Um, but really, the budget itself is really more just on the amount of time to do the project. The drone itself is really an overhead cost when it comes to business. And those costs, like discussed, have been going down, and I think one gentleman made the dis that a lot of times the cameras are more expensive than the drones anymore, you know, mm -hmm. just because the optics have to be more precise than that. But uh, um, the uh, use of more propeller-type drones than a fixed-wing type drone is still more commonly used. Uh, but we had a 400-acre project up in uh, the university up in Boulder, and we mapped that in a day. Now, we had to pretty much clear the whole campus. It was They were shut down for the, mm -hmm. the day and everything and else, but it was doable in that. So, But that was, and I could see in the down down the road, that could be done maybe in a couple hours, you know, with more of a fixed wing than, uh, and better technology for your LIDARs and things like that too. But uh, we were doing a big project and it was part of the work. But really it's more just the time you, either your client was willing to pay for to do a drone flight if it's if it's necessary, if they think they'll usually pay for it. But like I said, if it really doesn't gonna enhance the information or that, then you know, save the time and that. So mm -hmm. so really need to it's it may be fun to do it, but it's really not necessary and uh <laughs> and that so yeah you know, yeah you know, wouldn't get paid to have fun you know oh, <laughs> that's love getting I, out there <laughs> <laughs> you, i love hearing you that get paid to, for that fun yeah. <laughs> awesome you guys tyler kabish thank you so much for joining me i really appreciate it mark hummels also appreciate it you guys have given me some wonderful information here on the drone technology within civil engineering so thank you very much for your time and it's been a pleasure mm. having you on oh nice to be here thank you. thank you so much for having us yeah. yes my pleasure and again be sure to like and subscribe our youtube page while you're here you can find this podcast and more at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast have a wonderful day